go ahead and hit. Ready. All right, cool. Well, thank you guys for joining us uh, this afternoon um, with some begging and pleading. I didn't threaten uh, Karen McKimmy agreed to uh, come on. If you don't know her stuff, um, you should. And I'm sure she'll tell you about how to find all of that. So um, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and then we're ready to rock and roll. Okay. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm Karen McKimmy. I am at Catawba Ridge High School right now. Um, I was at Fort Mill High School for 11 years. Uh, we did a little 15 minute weekly show called The Buzz. Um, and it was pretty successful, um, won a couple things and, and did well. And then I decided to um, follow our principal left to build a new high school in our district. And so I decided to, well, I was kind of asked, voluntold to go over and start the program, the new TV program over there. And so now I'm at Catawba Ridge High School and been there for what, a year and not quite a year, right? Because we all left in March. So um, I had uh, a couple challenges with starting the program is that none of the students that I currently had at Fort Mill were gonna be going over to the new school. Um, they were all being pulled from another high school that had a TV program, but um, kind of a struggling one, not, not great. So, um, so I was starting completely from scratch with all new students. Um, and I only had a total of, in all three classes, because we're on a four by four schedule, um, in all three classes, I think I had total 24 students. So nobody really signed up for the class. They didn't really know what it was. So um, this year was, was a challenge um, on top of all the other challenges we've had this last semester. But um, we decided, or I decided that there was no way we were going to be able to do a weekly show. We were going to have to uh, kind of drop kick that. And I wanted to do something different anyway. I've been doing the weekly show for 11 years. So um, um, we decided to go to a daily only on social media. So I'll share that later if you, you want to see it. But um, um, I actually really liked it. I, you know, it was, it was different. It's, it's uh, a little faster. Um, but um, I liked the format that we were going to. And the whole reason why I decided to go to that over a show was because I knew how to get the talent ready very fast to be on camera because um, that's something that I love to do. So I knew I could do that part. And then the storytelling and the editing and the B-roll and all that kind of stuff was going to have to be kind of taught later. So um, I'm presenting today coaching talent. And I kind of want to know, um, like, like, butt in and raise your hand or ask a question or shout out or say something, you know, if there's stuff I, I'm touching on that I'm going too fast or you want to know more about, um, or if it's something that you don't even care for me to go deeper. Um, I'm pulling kind of three main um, lessons that I do with my kids. Um, I teach a whole lesson um, right at the very get-go at the beginning of, um, of the semester when I get brand new kids. I teach a whole unit on body language. And so that's really how I start, which is probably weird. You know, you'd think you'd introduce cameras and all that kind of stuff. But I definitely start with body language because I want them to know in their space um, how they're presenting themselves. So I do body language. We do... Um, a lot of nonverbal communication stuff, and then we go to um, how to shoot stand-ups and all that. So I'm kind of pulling a couple different things, and I pull them together into one unit, one little thing for you guys today. So if it seems a little disjointed or something doesn't make sense, please let me know. And and um, and and I want feedback from you guys too. Like if there's something that you would like to know more about, I I know some stuff. I don't know everything, but. Um, but this is something that I love, and I love the on-camera talent part of our, of our job, I guess. Um, a little bit of background, I was a news producer um, prior to accidentally falling into teaching. So, um, and that was a long story, but, um, but yeah, I did not set out to teach this at, by any stretch. I actually wanted a lacrosse team at our high school. And so um, the principal made me a, a deal. If he introduced lacrosse at our high school, then I would teach the TV class. That's really how it came about. It was crazy. So um, I, I am not a great teacher. 
Um, I'm learning how to teach, but um, that is was a much harder learning curve for me than just being a news producer. So that's my background. So a news producer, you know, glorified writer. I love to write and I know how to find good talent. And that's that's kind of the extent. The engineering part, that's why we have Tom. So um, so I'm going to just go ahead and start and I'm going to share my my screen with you guys um, and pull it up here. And then please stop me or Tell me I'm an idiot on certain stuff and I'm, I'm good with that. We're all kind of, oh wait, you said I can't, you disabled my screen attending. Tom. Sorry, hang on a second. Let me, I don't know how to fix that. I haven't had that issue before. Let's see. Um, uh, well, how? Screen, you're trying to share screens, multiple yeah. participants. There we go. Now you should be able to. Who can share all participants? Yep, you should be able Yay. to. Okay. Okay. Um, and the whole reason I, I know Tom had originally scheduled me on Google Meets, and I don't know if you guys have been using Google Meets with your kids. For the life of me, I, I was like, I if I share my screen, I can't see faces of people, and I am so into nonverbal feedback that I <laughs> that I need nonverbal feedback. So I needed to see everybody. So I said, please switch it to Zoom because at least I know I can share my screen and see you guys at the same time. So, um, so why do we need to develop the on camera personality? Um, when, when you think about the on-camera personality, it's, it's not just on camera, it's also your voiceovers, it's stand-ups, it's anchoring. Um, I'm gonna try and touch on a little bit of all of it and um, hopefully it'll make sense when it's over. Um, I use um, this book, I love this book, it's called Well Spoken and um, I know a lot of public speaking teachers use it. Um, it's not a textbook, it's just a book for teachers to read. Um, I, I've had it for a really, really long time, and I love some of the techniques and things. It's basically for public speaking or oral communication, but he's got some really cool ideas in there. So I, I stole a lot of stuff that I use with my students from this book. Um, but what I love that he says is that um, the ability to verbally communicate with persons inside and outside the organization is ranked in the top four skills employers most desire. So we're always looking for those soft skills. And I always tell students when they come in my class, like, even if you don't go one step further, I'm at least gonna teach you a skill that's gonna be super marketable. So when you leave here, you don't wanna do TV anymore, that's fine. You're at least gonna be able to um, walk into a room with confidence and present yourself pretty well. And that will make you, you know, head and shoulders above most people. Um, so it's a great book to pick up. It's a small little paperback. Um, it's an easy read and he's got great things in there um, for learning about public speaking. So we have a lot to teach, you know, storytelling, video, composition, interviewing, transcribing, script writing, sound lighting, editing, and how you look and how you sound is usually the last thing that people even care about in our business. Um, I judge a lot of different um, TV programs across the country for different press organizations and stuff, and I'm so hyper-focused on the initial presentation. Um, and you know, judging subjective, there are some people that, you know, oh my God, they had great sound and that's all they're gonna focus on. And so this is something that I do focus on, but I'm like, it's the first thing that anybody sees about you um, is that initial first shot, um, that initial first graphic even, or so that they see, you know, and you want it to be something that's gonna draw people in. Um, but I do notice that for a lot of TV programs, they just don't care. And it's a touchy situation. It's hard to tell kids like, Hmm, you got to clean that up a little bit or whatever. That's not something that, um, that I guess appearance shouldn't be that big of a deal, but in this industry, initially it sometimes is. So, um, so I feel it's super, super important. Um, a lot of the reasoning, um, and this is proven reasoning is that it builds a sense of trust, credibility, and professionalism with your program. If your kids look professional, um, and sound professional, people end up thinking that the story is even better than it might have been because they, they presented it so well. Um, builds a relationship with the audience. I always tell my students like, David Muir, 6.30, if you're gonna wanna know where I am, 6.30 every night 
it's watching David Muir because I love him. And I personally believe he loves me too, even though he's never met me. But we have a relationship because he looks right at me, he's handsome, and um, whatever he's telling me is usually not the truth. But you know, I'm just gonna sit there and watch him at 6.30. He's built a relationship with me, that's his job. So now I am a viewer that's going to constantly tune in. And we wanna build our audiences um, in high school as well. And we want them to tune in to us and we want to build that relationship with them. Um, and it also removes unnecessary distractions that take the viewer away from the story. Girls especially were our own worst enemies. Why is her hair like that? Why is she wearing that kind of eyeshadow? Why is she doing that? Why is she, you know, and they're not listening to the content that somebody worked so hard on. So I'm like, take a stuff away that you don't need um, um, so that people don't get distracted from your actual story. Um, so I have to do acronyms for everything because I um, have severe ADD and can't remember a whole lot. So everything I do, usually I try and tie something into it. Um, and Pav Legs is what I came up with for kind of, and I stole it from I don't know how many different people, but what we really touch on um, in terms of coaching talent, and that covers poise, voice, life, eye contact, appearance, gestures, and speed. And so I said that I start all of my classes with a whole unit on body language, and thankfully texting has really helped um, hit this lesson home um, with my students because I will just throw um, this graphic up on, on the board and say, tell me what it means. What are people trying to say in this text? And you'll get somebody that says, you know, the guy was weird or, you know, or the guy was cute, but we really don't know, you know, exactly what this means, which is why after the initial texting started, we had to go to emoticons, right? Because once you have emoticons, now I can tell kind of the context of the message. So now I get kind of, okay, I think I like that guy. So that's okay, but is it that I like that guy or that I think you like that guy? And even with the emoticons, we still can't necessarily tell the complete context of the message. And I always tell the kids, I'm like, I don't know how many students I've sent just the letter K, like they ask me a question or tell me something and I say K, I respond with K. I didn't realize how much I was making them mad. They thought I was mad at them, that I wasn't giving them. I just put, and I was like, no, it's just fast. You know, I don't need to type OK. Um, and they were like, no, that means you're mad at somebody. And I was like, do you see under, you understand why we lose so much in just some of that communication? So I know you guys know this, but what you say is only 7%. How you say it is 38%, but how you show it um, is really where you get your communication across. So if I said, so what's up with that guy from second block? You know, now with my body language and my face, um, I'm actually transmitting more of a message than just what I did from a regular text. So that's how I kind of start with them. Like you have to be aware of how you're emoting on camera or what you're doing with your body and why it's so important. So I asked them, this is a little outdated I'm noticing with my kids. I always say in history class, did anybody cover the Nixon uh, Kennedy debates or know anything about them? And of course, less and less obviously are um, doing those in history class. But um, I pull up this little thumbnail because if you look at Nixon's body language versus Kennedy's, um, one is very nervous and uptight, one is definitely more relaxed. Kennedy knew that, that they both knew it was going to be televised, but they didn't, um, Kennedy understood the power of media and your presence on camera, so he wore the power blue suit so he would stand out. Um, Nixon's very washed out, so he blends in with the background. Um, and I know I'm probably telling you what you already know, but um, those that listened to the debates on the radio felt that Nixon won, and those that watched the debate on TV said that Kennedy won. And it was just how his presence made such a big deal. Um, and if and we won't run through it all because I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but Nixon definitely started sweating um, when he was on camera. He, um, Kennedy came with makeup on, so he was not shiny on camera. His overall presence was just better. Um, initially, um, also teaching how you stand on camera. 
alignment equals integrity. And we learn that a lot in body language, that when you're in alignment, um, you're more trustworthy and truthful. That's why anchors look straight into the camera and why they're positioned the way they are into a, into a camera. Because anytime, if you think about a slinky cat going into a room, anything that's a little bit out of alignment tends to lose some of that trust base. So I show President Clinton. This is Clinton um, at the um, Democratic National Convention when he got the nomination and everybody was super excited. Um, and if you look, and he is a very well-trained speaker, where his eyes and where his finger are going are in complete alignment, okay? He's happy, he's telling us the truth, uh, everybody likes what he's um, saying, and this is somebody that's been trained in body language and trained in speaking. But what happens when he gets under duress and something is not quite right? What happened? So he has an affair, he gets on, um, and I was still working in news at this point. So um, I remember basically falling off my chair when I saw this and I said, he is flat out lying. And so when I cover body language with my students, I also say it makes you a better reporter. It makes you keep asking questions if you can see that somebody's not telling the truth. Um, and if you look at him here, so his eyes are pointing one way and his finger is pointing the other. He's not completely in alignment, his head and everything. And so he's under duress, he's under stress, and he's lying. He's doing the same gestures, but his gestures are just incongruent and so therefore less trustworthy. Um, you guys know who this is? Recognize him at all? Yes, okay, so accused of using steroids. Um, he decides to go on uh, 60 Minutes and go against Katie Couric, who is one of the best interviewers of our time, I think, um, and say that he's not using steroids. So he decides to do this national platform. I don't know who his handlers are. They should have told him not to because he's not a very good liar. She asks him flat out, are you using steroids? Human growth hormone or any other substance? No. What does he do? He nods his head, yes, but he says no. And so again, incongruent, and he's basically giving her the platform to pound him and pound him and pound him. And of course, the next day after that interview aired, it came out that he actually did use steroids and he admitted it. Um, so knowing all that and looking up on those little tells, and the reason why I start with that first is because I said you do have tells your body has tells when you're nervous it has tells um, when you're not telling the truth things like that and you need to be cognizant of those when you're on camera so if you be intent if you're intentional about your stance movement and posture watch your head body and your feet especially the feet um, feet are the farthest away from the brain so they're the hardest to control and if you ever notice anybody's feet start paying attention to their feet when they're talking to you we like feet flat on um, next to somebody. Girls tend to stand with one foot this way, if you ever notice that, which means a very quick exit. We can get away if we need to. Um, so we're animalistic in nature. Um, the kids love this lesson, and I do have a whole huge lesson I'm happy to share with you guys on body language. Um, so, um, so they kind of just get that in their heads that every movement that they make on camera is, is important. Um, appearance. Why do we talk about appearance? This is a hard one. This is really, really hard. And of course, I go back to Elle Woods because she's so important to me. But, um, but when, when we think about appearance, we want to dress for the job and dress for the location, both of them. Um, I have a really hard time with, well, there's a whole big reason, but kids in baggy sweatshirts, um, baggy clothes, not being very put together. It's hard. That's hard. But, um, but, you know, just kind of, you don't have to get in a three-piece suit at all. You don't have to sit there in a tie at all, especially if you're out in the field. Um, that makes no sense. So we have um, Capital Barbie coming in, and she totally is out of place. She doesn't look like where she's supposed to be, Ab absolutely put together, but she's out of place. So I always say dress for where you're going to be. If you're on the sidelines of a football game, um, a collared shirt, preferably with your logo or branding on it or whatever. Um, if you are out in the field somewhere wearing a tie, 
um, and a button down shirt, probably not the best idea in the world. Roll your shirt sleeves up and dress for the location, but still dress neat. Um, avoid logos or branding unless it's your brand. And I'm, and I push this a lot, like push your brand, push your TV brand, get a bunch of, um, collared shirts made with your logo on them and push the brand. So that way they have them and they, um, and they, there's no excuse not to wear it. Girls don't like them though. Um, but anything with like a big, huge logo across the chest, it's very eye catching. It's made there for a reason for us to look at it. We don't want people to look at that. So if you take that away, it makes a much better appearance. Um, distracting jewelry or accessories. I have to warn the girls about this a lot. Big clunky earrings will reflect light back, obviously, in a studio, so you don't want those. Bracelets, things like that, clink against the microphone um, and can cause a little disturbance. So you wanna pare that down and you don't want that to be what people look at. Again, we go back to, you want it to be content. You want it to be the story you're telling. So don't take away from the story that you're telling. So when we go back to body language, um, Violet in The Incredibles, do you guys remember Violet in The Incredibles? Um, what was her superpower? That she was invisible. She could make herself invisible, right? And what did she start out looking like? I, was, I always put a picture of her up on the screen for my kids. She had her hair over her face and she was wearing kind of bigger, baggier clothes. Why? Because she wanted to hide. That's a definite tell um, when you're wearing big baggy clothes, when your hair is in your face, you are trying to hide. Disney didn't do that by accident. You know, that's stuff that's all been studied. Um, anybody that's wearing that kind of stuff is usually trying to pull into themselves. And we don't want that barrier on camera. So you want to pull that hair back from your face and you want clothes that are actually fit you correctly. Um, the reason why poker players use sunglasses and hats it's because they're hiding their tells, they're hiding their eyes, they're hiding the things that we can see to connect with them. So we don't want that. We want that connection with our audience. So you wanna make sure that hats, headwear, and sunglasses are off, um, of course, unless it's a religious custom. Um, but when, you know, you get pushback from kids. I get pushback from kids all the time. Well, this is just me. This is how, who I am. But if you can kind of explain the reasoning behind it, why you don't want to necessarily do that. I get that's who you are, but this, where we are is in a workspace and a job. Um, and so we can't necessarily do exactly who we, you know, I would love to come to school in yoga pants every single day, but I can't do that because I have a level of professionalism that I have to portray. And would you take me seriously? So um, if you kind of explain that background a little bit sometimes you get a little bit more buy-in because I'm all about the buy-in and sometimes it's not always easy I'm going okay too fast too slow we're good all right um, context um, I do believe in having fun so they're high school students not little adults um, and dressing so I have a, a whole nother lesson called how to teach stand-ups that don't suck um, and it's because teaching stand-ups to kids and getting them used to having great really dynamic stand-ups. Like if you're just standing up there talking to me, then you're a giant diva and you need to wear a diva crown because all you're doing is being on camera. But if you can give me a reason why you're on camera and giving me a stand-up, then that's gonna be a good thing. And so this is my little Stephanie. She, um, we've all had to do the story packages on um, the school musical that's coming out in the spring and how many different ways can we do this school musical? Like it's crazy. So, um, so she decided, she's like, I'm going to go backstage. I'm going to get dressed up and show just how long it takes to get into costume. Um, so maybe, you know, kids see behind the scenes how much hard work goes into the show and maybe they'll want to come see it more instead of just saying the show is opening this day. Right. So she got dressed up. Uh, we were doing sister act. So she, she gets dressed up, she's in costume, she's doing her stand up and it makes it so dynamic um, than just standing there and saying, tonight, you know, the school musical opens. And so that's the stand ups that I look for. And that's why, do you always have to dress professionally? No, you don't. You can have fun with what you're wearing if it fits the story, for sure. Um, okay, the next one is color, and, um, and I'm big on this. Now, again, getting buy-in and finding lessons that you can do with your students to get them excited about being in your class. 
Um, this is just something that I like to do at the beginning as kind of an icebreaker. It's a stupid icebreaker. All icebreakers are kind of stupid, but, um, but they seem to kind of get a kick out of this. And it's just, I always say, let's determine what your power colors are. What do you look best in on camera? Um, kids kind of love this. They love to know that they're gonna look good and, and um, get that little bit of confidence. So um, we do a white paper vein activity. So basically I split the kids into two. Uh, they kind of get, you know, hi, my name is, and we do this on the first day of school. Um, they get a piece of white paper, and if you stick it right underneath, um, right behind your ear, which is where we don't get a lot of sun and there's not a, dis a lot of discoloration, and just ask them to see what is reflecting back on that white paper, um, and see if you can determine what um, skin tones everybody has. And so um, um, it will tell you if you're a warm, a cool, or a, a neutral. Sometimes we go spring, summer, fall, winter. What, you know, what are you? I've had people come in and um, do little presentations on color and what, you know, what your skin tone color is. Um, and I think it makes them feel confident. I do say, you know, every time you're wearing a shirt that somebody says, hey, you look amazing today. Like write down what color is it? You know, what, what does it look like on me? Because that's something that probably you look really good in is, is that color. So if you reflect yellow, greenish, light brown, you're a warm, pink, rosy, or bluish, you're a cool, and gray or ashen, you're a neutral. Um, and so just having them determine what their color palette is to wear on camera is great. Peacock blue is my favorite color on camera. It looks good on everybody. It's the universal color. Everybody looks good in peacock blue, everybody. Rosy pink is a great one too, and that's 99.9% .9 of the people unless you're a, a redhead, like a, a vibrant redhead, then it's a little bit iffy. Um, but you know, you put, you put that really reluctant guy in a great, nice fitting peacock blue button down shirt and tell him he looks amazing and you watch the shoulders go back and you watch the chin come up and you just watch their demeanor change because you're giving them the confidence that they need to get in front of that camera. Now, remember, I was working with all brand new students this semester um, or this year that had never done this before and I had not a lot of time to get them confident enough to be on camera. You get those kids are like, I'm not going to do it. Oh, yes, you are, but I'm not going to let you not look good. You know, is that is what I tell them. You're going to look the best you've ever looked. And so giving them that that confidence to do that. Um, I just love watching the change in in their bodies when they do that. So colors to avoid black on camera. Obviously, black does not reflect back on your face. White steals the light and can reflect back into the camera. So be careful of those colors. Um, if they know their color wheel, I always ask, you know, do you guys know your color wheel? Red, oranges and yellows just keep them muted. Um, and hounds tooth, tight stripes, checks will give the more moire effect. So if you see that, it makes it give a little wavy. None of them know what hounds tooth, tooth is, by the way. I always have to pull it up. And I'm like, none of you are wearing this. Your great grandmother wears this. Nobody wears hounds tooth. But they do sometimes come with those little teeny tight checked um, shirts. And you'll actually see an example of that uh, later on in this because I pulled one. Um, on camera makeup, even for the guys, this is a fun day. Um, you can either get, um, get somebody in to come in that, um, is, that will work for free, like from Ulta, or call them and say, would you mind doing a little bit of on camera makeup session with my kids? Um, because the kids actually like it. Of course, the guys kind of scoff initially, but here's an example of a couple of she that that's a, uh, Jake and here we are powdering one of my old anchors um, to keep the shine off. And even though he looks like he's not super happy about this, he loved every minute of being pampered and getting that powder on his face. I actually keep a palette of powders um, in the in my back room that would cover all skin tones and just brushing them up a little bit so when the lights hit them, they're not super super shiny. And I have a giant nine head, so I'm very cognizant of when that light's reflecting back um, on my forehead. So um, when it comes to your voice, every word heard, and, and I tell them, be remembered for what you say, not how you say it. Especially, um, I'm in South Carolina, if you don't know. Um, South Carolina, Georgia, some of the southern states, Mississippi, 
Um, we have a Southern accent. What do people think of when they hear Southern accents? They think we're not very intelligent and we're not very bright. Um, I grew up in Virginia and I've lived in South Carolina for most of my adult life. So um, I can turn it on if I need to. And that's fine. We don't want to get rid of culture and we don't want to get rid of um, some of that, you know, just who you are, that essence of who you are, but we also don't want to take away from what we are saying. So I use this quote from Jeff Foxworthy that I love because he says, you don't want somebody going, all righty then, so what we're going to do is saw the top of your head off, root around for a bit and see if you can't find that dab burn clock. You know, nobody wants their brain surgeon saying that. We want them to sound professional. We want them to sound like they know what they're talking about. So sometimes um, working on the voice and how we project our voice is super important because um, we've, got, we've got to work on accents a little bit, just bringing them down. I don't think that the news um, does that Midwest, transcontinental Midwest accent anymore. I think it is a little bit more varied. Um, but they need to bring it, tone it down just a little if you've got anybody with an accent. And I don't, I don't ever single anybody out. This is something that I do with all of my kids just so that they listen uh, to the tone of their voice and how, um, how they sound. Vocal fry and up speak. Thank you, Kim Kardashian. If you don't know what it is, this is what the girls are doing. So my, my American accent that you, you heard on Terminator kind of changed a little bit into um, how you know ballet. It's like this, she's like this whole like situation. <laughs> so amazing. taking that, taking that little, um, a lot, Kim Kardashian does it. A lot of YouTubers do it where they just fry. It's called vocal fry. They fry out their face and they kind of dip it down. And I, and I say, you know, if you're doing that, first of all, you're really hurting your vocal cords by doing that. Second of all, um, that's great for you. And if you want to do that for, with your friends, but when we speak on camera, we don't ever want to dip down at the end of a sentence or anything. We want to go up. We want to add inflection. So if you're doing, um, if you're doing vocal fry, if you're frying out your voice, you're actually swallowing those last syllables. So you don't want to do that. And then the up speak, when everything's a question, and they talk like this. Um, yes, you're coming up at the end of the sentence, but uh, it's not um, great. And here's the reason why. They did a huge study on when women especially um, speak like this, and they were deemed less educated, less competent, less trustworthy, and less hireable. So I always go back to, you do you, that's fine. But when you're presenting in front of somebody, this is what you want to do. It could be a fake you, that's fine. Um, but this is going to give you a shot at something that somebody else who's doing what you're doing um, may not know. And we don't want to already give ourselves more albatrosses if we're going in for a job interview or anything. We don't want to weigh ourselves down with something that we can change. So this is something that we can change. Um, and, and let them know the importance of their voice and how they're presenting themselves. So how do you teach voice to students and how do you teach this? Um, I like to have a little bit of fun. So we all love Anchorman and all of his tongue twisters. Um, some you cannot put out on camera because they're bad words. But, um, but I do use little clips from Anchorman and from um, High School Musical um, and anything that I can find where they're warming up their voice because your voice is an instrument. I teach them their voice is an instrument and something to be taken care of. You have to tune it, you have to warm it up, um, and you have to be ready to use it. So tongue twisters are great and it's fun. If they're, if they're kind of getting unruly, just pulling up a, a couple of tongue twisters and making everybody say them really fast, it gets them laughing. Um, vocal warm-ups, teaching them how to do the vocal warm-ups and um, warming up their mouth, stretching, their mouths. There's tons of different examples on YouTube on how to warm up your face by stretching. It's funny. It makes people laugh, and it's a bonding. Um, it's bonding when in your class once they kind of let their guard down a little bit. I don't do this at the very beginning because they've got to be able to trust each other enough to be goofy and silly. And once they are, it's a great way to just get people laughing and get some action in your room. Um, breathing exercises, deep breathing exercises. 
And then, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the Chubby Bunny Challenge where people shove their mouths full of marshmallows and then try and talk, and it's really funny. Um, I'll take scripts and have them read a couple sentences of scripts with marshmallows or gummy worms shoved in their, in their cheeks so that they're over enunciating and over pronouncing and see, we do a little contest. Who can, who can we understand the best? And really what they're doing is they're warming up their mouths and they're learning how to over pronounce, over enunciate because that's gonna come across on camera a little bit better. And it's fun. I used to do it with jelly beans till somebody pointed out that that might be a choking hazard. So that's why we switched to marshmallows and gummy worms. I didn't even think about that. Um, but again, another fun icebreaker Friday activity when you're looking for something to do um, and you want to introduce the importance of treating your voice like an instrument. Um, life, inserting passion into everything that you say. Nobody is a stranger to uh, Bueller here and Ferris Bueller. And I'll play this for a while in my classroom and say, you know, really how excited would you be if I walked in here and said, okay guys, today we're gonna talk about voice and we're gonna talk about the importance of voice and why you need it. You would all be asleep within five minutes. Well, when we have viewers, you wanna make sure that your viewer, viewers stay interested. So you've got to have that life in your voice. Um, and it's, it's important. What is it? It's just inflection and using inflection. So for me, it's not DiGiorno. It is delivery. Um, it is how you deliver. And when I'm writing critiques on shows, I'm always like, stop reading your scripts, deliver your scripts. And I am a huge proponent of take the teleprompter away. Now that gets a lot of like, we can't do that. We're a live show. Um, we're, we, there's no way that we can take a teleprompter away during your show. Fine. You don't have to, but learning how to deliver a script off a teleprompter is a skill and it's a hard one and it's, it's not easy. So they have to learn how to deliver before you stick them on the teleprompter. Otherwise they're reading, they get to the end of a sentence and they're dipping down and they're just reading me news. I don't need the news to be read to me. I need it to be delivered to me. So, um, so I say take the teleprompter away initially. Don't let them use that as a crutch until they build enough skill to be able to deliver the news off of it correctly. Stand up when doing voiceovers. So many times we have a great stand up, then they get into edit and they do their voiceover and you notice that their voice does not match at all and the enthusiasm and the inflection is gone. It's easy to give enthusiasm and life when a camera's on, but when you're in that room all by yourself doing your VO, you notice the level of enthusiasm dips down. Well, one of the things is they're usually reading a script. Can you guys see me? Like this, they're, they're kind of like leaned over and um, that compresses your vocal cords, number one. So you're not gonna get the same sound quality and there's no energy at all. Um, so that's gonna be a definite dip. So I don't let them, I don't put a, um, a chair in our VO room at all, in our sound room. Stand up when you're doing VOs, always, because that's gonna give you more energy. Have someone invested in the outcome in the room with you. And why I put invested in the outcome in capital letters is because bringing your BFF, who just wants to get on Snapchat on their phone, um, if you have a special sound room or a special area where maybe not everybody sees or you don't have a clear line of vision, um, that's not helping anybody. But somebody that's super invested in the outcome of your package or your story or you trust to give you good feedback um, is a great person to have in the VO room with you so that you're delivering the script to them and they might say it's too fast it's too slow you dip down here I don't understand this word do it again that's the person you need to bring in because that person's going to bring out the best in you um, make your voice match the moment so I had this adorable student a couple years ago god I love her so much she's amazing um, absolutely beautiful girl, looked a lot like Malibu Barbie, and she decided to do a story. She really wanted to do a story on, um, we're not far from Charlotte. So the Sully Sullenberger plane crash, the, the plane that crashed in New York that took off from Charlotte, they were actually bringing the plane back to put it in a museum in Charlotte. So she was doing a follow-up story about this plane crash and she got two um, of the original flight attendants that were on the flight to grant interviews. This was gonna be a really good story. And 
Um, I was super excited about it. She was super excited about it. She was doing her stand up in the cockpit of the broken plane because it was in the museum. We got special permission to go in there, super excited. She um, was dressed fine, but she talked about the plane crash the entire time with a big huge smile on her face because she thought that's what she had to do. And so, um, so I was like, it's Malibu Barbie meets a plane crash. Like it's just, no, you know, you've, you've got to match your face for the tone. And I do tell the kids a lot. I'm like, you may have a kick-ass story, but if it's not your style um, and you don't know that you can deliver it in your style, because hopefully you're developing across the board the kind of style that you are. Look at Steve Hartman, he has a style. Everybody has a certain style to their news, to their storytelling. And if it doesn't fit, pass on that story, give it to somebody else, produce it. But maybe you're not the on-camera talent for it if that's not your style of story. So um, she made up for it in spades. She's done a lot of great stories, but it was her first time out of the gate. Then after that, she's like, oh, that didn't look good at all. I'm like, yeah, because it didn't fit the tone. So teaching facial expression is great, but then the facial expression has to match the story. Um, laugh to warm up, always laugh. So try and, I mean, dad jokes are great. I don't deliver them very well, but, um, but they're fun to do, get kids laughing. That actually warms up their vocal cords and hydrate. Coffee, caffeine, that dries out your vocal cords. So remember, it's an instrument, you wanna take care of it. So bringing a bottle of water in with you to the VO room or wherever you are, making sure that your vocal cords are hydrated, super important to keeping that voice nice and pliable and, um, and good for on camera. So far so good? Okay. Um, adding life to words can change meaning. So when we talk about um, how we're going to teach um, how do you teach inflection, right? That's kind of hard to do, especially when they're reading. So um, I'll play this commercial for you for in a minute, in a second, but um, I write these three sentences on the board and I say, how many different meanings can we get out of one sentence just by changing our inflection? So don't do that to your brother. That's one, right? Don't do that to your brother meaning you could do something completely different, just not that. Don't do that to your brother, okay? You, but you could do it to your sister or your friend, but just not your brother. So I've changed the meaning three different ways just by changing my inflection and why inflection is so important when you're, when you're doing your scripts, when you're looking at your scripts. Um, so this back. commercial is perfect. This is really cost. Takes arm nervously for every one of those moments. This is ridiculous. There's one of these. Is this my car? What? This is ridiculous. This can't be happening. This can't be happening. Oh, it's happening, sweetheart. Oh, it's happening, sweetheart. So just by their inflection, you can see the completely different meanings of each of each scenario. Obviously there's set and there's body language and stuff that goes in there, but they've changed their inflection, so they've changed the meaning. And that's why inflection is so important when we are delivering a script. What words do we want to em emphasize? What words do we want to um, really hit home? And we don't have the luxury of people going back and being able to reread. I mean, yes, they can rewatch if they want to, but we have to make sure that certain things really impact our audience. We have only a couple seconds. So by adding that inflection, it's gonna punch words that we want them to remember. It's just adding, adding emphasis. Um, look, looking straight into a camera when doing a stand-up, keeping that eye contact going. Um, looking at an interviewee, anchor, partner, and providing nonverbal feedback. This is huge to me. If you have two people on camera at a time, being able to interact with each other and not either deer in the headlights, looking straight and waiting for my turn to read off the teleprompter, um, or not knowing when to look at your co-anchor. Um, it needs to be a like it needs to be a kind of a three-way partnership. So I tell them, I'm like, the reason why we do nonverbal or body language all at the beginning is because nonverbal feedback is so important with when you're on camera, when you're interviewing somebody to be able to nod and smile and keep them talking, the more you look at them and keep them talking, your interviewee is gonna talk more because you're giving them nonverbal feedback, nonverbal feedback to your partner um, so that you're not stepping on any of their words. We don't wanna do, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, 
I get it, you know, and it keeps them from interrupting and it keeps them actively listening because they're nodding. Um, and that's why when we talk about body language and we talk about all those nonverbal cues, um, now maybe hopefully you're understanding why I put that at the very beginning of every semester instead of waiting or not doing it because it feeds so much into everything that we do when we're on camera. Blink rate, I talk a lot about blink rate. Um, the more we blink, the less trustworthy we are, and it seems like we're nervous. That, that definitely gives a, a nervous feeling. Um, and then I tell them when they're on camera, don't fall out of your shot. So stop, stop with the, you want to be, you want to give yourself a little bit of time for edit points and to not just relax your body completely when, um, when you're doing the stand-up. And then they'll say to me, but... Now you may think that I'm a huge Will Ferrell fan. I'm really, I don't know if I am or not, but he's great for examples for what not to do in, in, in on camera. So I get kids all the time. I don't know what to do with my hands. And they'll either be, you know, the death grip on the, on the anchor desk where they're clutching their hands together. That's not how we talk. That's not natural. And it also doesn't help add inflection to your voice if you're channeling all your energy into your knuckles. Every bit of your energy is going straight to your knuckles. It's not going into your voice or into your face. So what do you do with your hands? Um, I'm a hand talker. So I love a stick mic. A stick mic will bring me in. It will give my hands something to do. Um, gestures need to be natural and they don't know. And so we get a lot of barn doors where they just open and close the barn doors. Um, but um, teaching them how to do natural hand motions is hard. And I say the more comfortable you are on camera, the better you'll be with your hand motions. But um, if you grab a prop or a toy or something to do in your stand up, now your hands are going to be even more relaxed and your body is going to be relaxed. So when we go back to teaching stand ups that don't suck, I always say grab a prop, have something in your hand, show me something. Because if you have something in your hand, it gives your hand something to do. It gives you something to refer to, and it will actually relax your body and your face so that you're a little bit more relatable on camera. You're not just standing there like, oh my God. So here are a couple of examples of, they're not Even great. Even didn't get all this stuff was predicted, just a little bit of this stuff here. Is a little, little bit of this stuff here, just roads. showing something. When you are a kid, don't you love science experiments? Especially the ones with big reactions. Even though she said especially. Well, one creative cook decided to take his love for food and science to create a tasty treat that everyone enjoys. Ice cream. Now, I know what you're thinking. How can you get your hands on some of these tasty treats? Well, lucky for you, a delicious cookie like this one could be yours in the very near future. So, very natural, very normal, and it's all because they have something. Now, again, I am not a teleprompter person. My kids don't use teleprompters, but... Their prop reminds them of what they have to say, too. They're going to refer to it. They're going to talk about it. Now that's going to make for a much more natural presence on camera. So just giving that their hands something to do. A little bit harder when you're anchoring because you can't really have a prop, you know, through the whole thing. Um, but they build their way up to that so that they learn how to hold their hands and use them um, naturally. Go from reporter to anchor. Um, your hands help emphasize what you're saying. Um, when you're two people on camera, remember to look at each other. Body position should change naturally. Um, and face is expressive and open and no hands barn doors. So I always go over this with my anchors. Again, this t-shirt, this shirt that um, Cam is wearing is one of those ones that gives the moray effect, even though I said not to do it. My kids listen just as horribly as everybody else's. Um, but if you notice his hand gestures now. and hers, um, they're they're a little bit more natural when you're doing those um, anchor moves. I don't necessarily like the clasped hands, but, um, but at least they're a little bit more relaxed and natural and they're not gripping on some kind of anchor desk and just channeling all that energy. And their shoulders should be down. They should be relaxed. The more relaxed they are, the more the viewer is going to be engaged with what they're saying because they don't look so uptight and unnatural. Speed. Up, 
I say the only time that you can be fast is if you're flying a jet plane. So um, watching the pacing. So all of this stuff is, is crazy. All of this stuff takes a lot of time to teach, but I do think that it's necessary because it gives them the foundations of what they need to build on later. So watching their pacing in any kind of script. Um, I take an excerpt and you can take an excerpt of any real reporter voiceover. Steve Hartman is great for doing those. Um, really great. He paces his, his um, scripts out so beautifully so that you can allow for gnat sound to come in and you can allow for breathing room and you can allow for people to absorb some of the words that you're saying. So pacing out your script is important. So I'll take, I'll just write out a script that I hear that I can get off YouTube or whatever. This is one that I got um, on training voices. I took this off of a YouTube news report and I'll give it to the kids without any form of punctuation. And then I'll ask them, I'll teach them about marking up a script. How do you mark up a script and how do you add for inflection? If I put periods everywhere and just did sentences, they will have a tendency to dip down at the end of every sentence, just like anybody would because we're reading it. If I don't give you punctuation and you separate your um, script out by the phrasing of how you want the phrase to go, then um, it's going to help you read it better when you're doing a VO or delivering it on the teleprompter. So I'll give them this and I'll, I'll say, hey, mark it up. And I want you to record it in your phone. Just record a VO of this in your phone. And then we listen to them and then I play the real one for them so that they can hear and see where the anchor did some inflection and where they put inflection and kind of hear the difference. Um, when it comes to marking a script, everybody has it different. Um, they do it differently. Um, there's no set rule like here's, I'm going to teach you how to mark a script. But I do say you pause and take a breath. Any of the um, blue lines are, there are shorter blue lines and longer blue lines, which means a little breath and a big breath um, so that you can finish out and an, the end of a sentence without really dipping down or losing that air. Um, then go through and tell me the words you want to emphasize, um, that you really want to inflect. And if you do not have a messy script before you go in to do a voiceover, then you haven't done it correctly. Your script should be a hot mess. There should be arrows like to remind yourself to go up. There's no, there's no right way to do it. There's your way to do it. And so what, what would make you pay attention to a certain word? And so mark it up, do it again. Um, there's so many M's um, in alliteration in this script. So I went ahead and highlighted all the M's so that we work on alliteration. Alliteration helps us remember um, what people are saying too. So that's why we use it in writing. So um, just giving um, a little bit of an emphasis to some of those repetitive um, sounds will help us remember it a little bit more. So um, what kind of exercises can you do with your kids? You can take them, give them their scripts, tell them to mark it up, or read it unmarked and then read it marked. Did it help? Did they remember things? Um, and it's just great, it's a great skill to learn. And by the time my kids get to seniors, I don't really look at their scripts at all. Um, they know, and I will look at, you know, I'll see stuff on their phones, I'll see rumpled up pieces of paper next to their desk and they are underlined, highlighted, you know, arrows up, arrows down all over the place because they just know that that's going to make them deliver it a little bit better. Pause for effect. Um, I want you to listen to that this, this sweet girl wrote this amazing script about um, this, it's a cat cafe that opened up near us and she put every very punny cat thing she could think of in the script. It was hyster hysterical. Um, but when she delivered it, she didn't deliver the script the right way. So she- I'm ready for some hysterical cat puns, everybody. This Clossum Cafe is the cure for a quick caffeine fix and will also be guaranteed to leave you feline groovy. Guaranteed to leave you feline groovy. So everything that she wrote that was so spectacular was lost because of her delivery. She didn't pause, she didn't emphasize, she didn't do everything that I had told her to do. Um, and so you lose those precious words that she wrote. I mean, she wrote this crazy good script and I was so excited about it, but 
um, it didn't it didn't pan out just because of the way she delivered it. So using pausing um, pausing in your script just for that emphasis makes such a such a difference. Um, don't stop until you're proud. This is written on my wall. Uh, it was written in my wall in my old classroom, and I redid it in my new classroom. Um, because just because you did a stand up or a VO or an anchoring thing, and if it didn't go great and the show already aired, yes, forget it, it's over. We go on and we do something again. But if it was a great script or a great story, do it again. Do it again, do it again, do it again. Learn because if they do that repetitive and they see the difference, they're going to remember it for next time. It's a little bit of that muscle memory that they do. Um, and also keep it for reels. Keep it for your um, anchor reel or your stand-up reel or whatever you're doing um, so that they can kind of see the progression. Um, sideline or cafeteria reports live. If you need to get the teleprompter away from some of your kids, get them out doing live stuff on social. The more they learn to think on their feet and deliver on, the, on their feet, the better they'll be when it's a recorded story. They'll know what they have to do. So um, I'm kicking, I kicked all my kids out very first week. I'm like, go tell me about the first week at our brand new high school. Somebody bring something back to me. And making them do it, asking questions, interviewing people all on the fly and not messing up will build that confidence. You don't ever have to air it. Nobody has to ever see it. And that's what I tell them. I'm like, I'm going to put it out there if it's good. Um, and if it's something that you're proud of, but I would never embarrass you by any stretch of the imagination. But the more you do it, the better you're going to be at looking at yourself on camera, hearing yourself on camera, and then being able to deliver on the spot and stumble and recover, being able to make a mistake and then keep going and, and adapt for that. That's a skill. And a lot of them don't have the confidence from the get go that they get there. Um, Read your shampoo bottle over and over again in the shower. Um, I know it sounds silly, but uh, those are some hard words to pronounce. It's great vocal warm up. The acoustics are awesome in your shower and nobody's listening to you and it's fun. So I will bring in ridiculous bags of ingredients and have them read them out loud. Um, and who can read it in the best voice? Who can, who can make me believe that these are the best ingredients ever? Um, and that's kind of a fun way to do stuff to get them used to um, really reading with inflection. Um, so that is kind of the cover of teaching all of my um, how I teach on camera talent. So to go back to it, poise, are you confident and in control? Even like fake it till you make it, but it will make me trust you better on camera if I can see that poise. Um, appearance. Content, context, and color. So pay attention to the color, pay attention to the context of your story um, and the content of your story. Are you dressed for what you are delivering? Um, if you're bringing me to the scene and you're dressed the part, I'm going to believe it a little bit more. Voice, be remembered for what you say, not how you say it. Don't have anything distract from your story. Life, make me want to listen to you. Why do we tune into certain people and listen to them? Why do we constantly go back to certain podcasts or certain um, shows or anything? Why? Because we like the people, we like what we hear, we like what we see. So that's your goal is to make people want to come back and watch you. Um, eye contact, have conversation with your viewer, gestures, make sure you have some toys and get involved with your story. It makes for a better stand up and it relaxes your body. And then speed, mark your script and pause. For effect. And that is it. Done. What do you think? Or not? It was great. Thank you. Yeah, I think it was awesome. I, I mean, I'm a former TV producer too, so it totally spoke to me. But I am wondering if we can get your email. Yeah, of course. Um, what should I do? Yeah. I can send, I can uh, I can put it in the calendar invite. Okay. Yeah, that way. Yeah, I'll... and then um, our um, Instagram handle is Catawba News, Catawba Ridge News at Instagram, and then Catawba Ridge TV on Twitter. Um, we stopped doing our show two weeks ago, so um, but we did a daily um, every day up until. Two weeks ago so that's all there but 
um, yeah, as a former news producer learning how to teach, it's fun, isn't it? <laughs> With employees, you can't hire and you can't fire. So that's even more fun. Does anybody have any questions? Anything? So you're at your new school. What, for like starting it up, fresh program, right? So what were your first like 30 to 60 days? Because these kids, you just got them. Like nothing what what was the focus on that i know that's not stand up but no um that's a great question because i kind of went in thinking i had no game plan i had no game plan i knew i didn't want to do a 15 minute show anymore so i knew that and initially i wasn't even going to put out any content i was like i'm going to have a year where i don't put anything out but then I was like, we're in a brand new school, starting all these brand new traditions. Somebody's got to capture it. So we're going to have to do something. So that's why I started with strictly Instagram, um, doing little teeny. And if you go back and look at our really rough beginning, you can kind of chronologically go through and see, see where we started. But um, um, I was like, and remember, they're all brand new and they hadn't done it. So I did initially started with body language. I'm going to teach you body language first. I'm going to teach you how to look good on camera before I even put a camera in your hand. I want you to do that. And of course, eye rolls, everything else. Nobody was super excited about that because they wanted to get cameras and go out and start shooting shit. And I'm like, you're going to shoot shit. It's going to be shit when you bring it back. Sorry. But you know, it, you know, totally. So like, but I want, we're going to have to, we're going to have to get capture this stuff and you're going to have to capture it. So you're going to have to be ready. So by day two, I was on doing body language just with the icebreakers and what color are you? Let's determine what, what you're going to look best in. Then um, we went on to just, I did stand-ups. How do you do a stand-up on camera? Then um, I started bringing in the cameras like, okay, so now we've got the cameras. How do we turn them on? How do we make not a whole lot of headroom? How do we not have things growing out of their heads? Um, and that led into camera angles. So after I did stand-ups, which is, I know it's a crazy, stupid way of doing things. And I think next year I might tweak it a little bit because it really was kind of hodgepodgey, but I was rushing um, to try and get people the ability to film, first of all, and then get them on camera to capture. Then, um, so then after camera angles, and I go over all the camera angles and we do a camera angles project, like I'm sure you all do you know, where they bring stuff back. Um, but I but I was like, a camera angles with a mission. You need to capture things that are going on. I need a tight shot of somebody eating lunch in the new cafeteria. I need a wide shot of, you know, practicing at the football game. I need a, mi a mid shot. I need a linking shot from this to this, you know, and I kind of listed it out. And then I said, then they come back with all of their footage. And um, I sent them out in teams because we don't have, you know, we're not one camera for every kid. Um, set them out in teams of two or three to capture all of it. Then um, once they got everything on the list, they came back and that's when I introduced editing, how to load the footage, how to organize your footage, and then um, how to start piecing it together in a sequence that kind of makes sense. So then I, I said, I want you to follow the list of what I asked you to do and make a story, a progressive story out of what you're doing. And, you know, very simple, how to cut a, a, you know, how to cut a clip, whatever, how to add music. And then I worked on where are you transitioning your shots, listening to the, um, listening to the beat of the music, listening to the pacing. Because when we talk about pacing in voice, um, I'm a stickler about this, drives me nuts when you watch a finished package you're listening to the VO and the B-roll is not changing with the pacing of what they're saying. And so I'm like, if you start with music, it's really easy to hear the beat of the music. But when you start talking, it's a little bit harder to hear um, the pacing of a voice. But you want that B-roll, you want the voice to be able to drive when you're changing your B-roll so that your, your eyes and your ears are all connected into that package. So when, you know, say Dog, Sea Dog, when he's saying you know, and we're out here on the football field, I'm seeing something that relates to that and I'm listening to the pacing. And I guess that kind of brings us up into then, um, once we're finished with all that, 
And that usually is a good four weeks or so of work, I would say. Um, now they know a little bit of camera work, how to shoot a little bit, how to edit a little bit, you know, and how to stand up on camera a little bit. And then we're going to go into the next couple projects um, to kind of then reinforce those skills, I guess. How's that? But it was like, it was like flying by the seat of my pants for sure. Um, Cause I, d I had no idea about the kids I was getting and what their skill level was or anything. So it was, it was, it was a challenge, but, um, and then working our way into pack story packages from that so that you can kind of see where we started. We just did little 15, 20, 30 minute, 30 second blurbs on Instagram. And then by the time we finished this, this semester, cause I only get them for a semester too. So by the time we were in the end of the semester, um, even with the pandemic, they at least had a story package in each little thing that we did. And, um, and I, I really fell in love with the format. And I think that's, I'm going to continue. Um, so were they just and airdropping their finished package to you to post to the Instagram account for the school? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. So we did everything on Google Drive, shared scripts, um, everything. And then they would, and a lot of them shot on their phones um, and then kind of pieced them together. Some were eh, some were great. And then they did, we shared everything on a Google Drive and then they dropped them in. And I did lower thirds for them and put them in a folder so they could pull down lower thirds. Um, some had access to After Effects and stuff and they could, they could do them, but a lot of them didn't, so. Great question. Anybody else? Thank you for your time. I will say that and we learned a lot. It's interesting because I come from a background of theater and a lot of those things tie into everything that you spoke of how if you don't fry your voice, your voice will last. You can throw your mm -hmm. voice this way, you can throw your voice that way. And a lot of things that you say you taught can be tied back into that. And that's the world I'm coming from into this. Well, I think that's what we do. And I, I say it's vocal acting. We're, we're vocal acting. I mean, it's not, you know, it's everything. That I think that there's such a close resemblance um, from theater into what we're doing because you are putting on a performance. You're dressing the part, you're looking the part, and then you're performing. And then whatever you do when you're off camera, that's you you know, that's fine, but it's still a performance. And if they approach it with that um, mindset, I think it helps um, them understand the, the reasons why a little bit more, but that's great. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Karen. You're welcome. And uh, awesome, let me...